Welcome to another episode of Dr. Brooke on the Block. It's time to grab a seat, buckle up, and take a ride with me through the wild, wild west of the Web3 universe, where we're going to learn all about coins and tokens, NFTs and contracts, digital real estate and the metaverse, and so much more. There is a lot to get through on the block, but I am here to pave the way and help you avoid those nasty pitfalls and rug pulls so you don't get hurt. I'm going to also introduce you to some interesting characters along the way. Are you ready? Your ride starts now. Welcome to yet another amazing adventure through the wild, wild west of Web3. I am your host, Dr. Brooke, the Crypto Practor. And I am joined by Nico Trotaris, my co-pilot for today's ride. So before I get into the introduction for Nico, I want to make sure you have your seatbelts fastened tightly and you have your arms and legs in the ride the whole time. We do not want anybody getting hurt today. This is going to be a fun and epic adventure. So without further ado, Nico, back in 1987, developed an accounting solution called My Office Mobile. In 1989, he became an Apple certified technician and then an authorized reseller for Apple. So this guy got to hang out with Steve Jobs. Like every six months, he was hanging out with Steve Jobs. Like how freaking epic is that? Like, oh my gosh, just to be able to say that you, can have, you could have hung out with Steve Jobs. And one of the things Steve would always tell Nico and the other people in that uh, group were that you just have to convert one person. Because back then at the time, nobody wanted to buy a Mac Macintosh computer because they were like, what the heck is this mouse and trash can? So Nico has not only taken his expertise in the you know, accounting solution and with Apple, but he's turned around and really built up a lot of different solutions. He's doing a lot of incredible things in the blockchain and Web3 space. And I'm really excited to have you here, Nico, today to share what you are doing. Hello and welcome. Hi, and thank you um, for interviewing me. It's um, a pleasure. And we met uh, a week ago, so yeah, things move quite rapidly. <laughs> they do. The one thing, for those of you who are local to the San Diego area that might be listening to this show, Nico runs a monthly um, blockchain uh, meetup group, and we meet in San Diego. And I got to attend the first like in-person live meetup since COVID and was really blown away by A, the entire presentation and what they have going on there and then getting to see the inside workings of a real live data center, which I've only seen in movies and heard about, you know, when you're reading about the internet, uh, but getting to see it in real life was really cool. So thank you for that amazing uh, meetup experience. And I look forward to attending more in the future. And for those of you in San Diego, make sure you make it out to that as well. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I guess you're going to be presenting at the next meeting. So I'm going to invite more women because I think more women need to get involved in uh, blockchain. Thank you for that, Nico. That I, I kind of want to jump on what you said there. And one of the things, because I do talk a lot, you know, about blockchain education and crypto education, a lot of people understand the word or maybe not fully understand the word crypto but they don't understand that crypto is part of blockchain. So a lot of times when I use the blanket term blockchain, they're like, well, what? I don't understand. Um, but I really want more ladies to get involved because this is a huge, huge transition of wealth uh, for generations to come. And we tend to, and you and I talked a little bit about this at the meeting about women tending to have more of an apprehension to jump into new things that they don't understand where men tend to, you know, just if their buddy or somebody they highly respect tells them about an opportunity, they're kind of all in, not 100% of the time, but generally speaking, that that tends to be what happens. And so we have a lot of male voices in the different spaces, especially in the Web3 blockchain space, and not a lot of females understanding what we're, is about to be ushered in. And I think that we, we definitely need more women there. So ladies, if you're listening, definitely join me. I'm excited to share and present and talk all about blockchain. But we're going to be talking to Nico and getting to hear Nico's story. So just like I ask all of my guests when I first start out the show is I want to know 
and as well as the audience, your introduction to blockchain, your introduction into this new technology. When did that first start and how did you get here today? Okay, so a little background. Um, I was born in a country called Iceland in Central Africa. And uh, in my book, I actually started out by saying from hunting animals with a handmade bone arrow to being a blockchain developer in San Diego is a big stretch. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is a big stretch, but I love it. Um, then we moved to Rhodesia, which became Zimbabwe, but there was a civil war. And uh, my parents uh, uh, were from Greece and, uh, you know, every male from the age of 18 to 55 had to be in the army for six months on, six months off. So we said, let's go back to Greece. And there, there was a dictatorship um, and I attended the uh, technical university and uh, the students there were doing anti-government propaganda. And so we were always being shot at with rubber bullets and tear gas. And I finally said, you know, I'm going to transfer to college in the U.S. So <laughs> I, just, I, I, I wanted to become a mechanical engineer in the automotive industry. So I picked Michigan, picked a university on the map and just came. Uh, after get, uh, getting a degree, um, I couldn't get a job. So I worked in a factory for $3.30 an hour. Wow. And my wife at the time says, is that what you're going to do all your life? And I said, no, pack the bags. We're moving to California tomorrow. So, wow. <laughs> so uh, moved to L.A., which is a very aggressive environment. Um, got a job for 11 months at an Apple store. Uh, got so many clients that I started my own business. And so uh, I've never looked back. And, uh, you know, owning your own business is a very difficult um, road to go along, but it's rewarding as well. And so what happened is uh, in 2011, I heard about Bitcoin and I opened an account with Coinbase. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, link your bank account and we'll give you two Bitcoin. And I thought, well, this is a little sketchy. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't do it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so then... Um, I've always been on the bleeding edge of just about anything. Um, and nowadays you can be on the bleeding edge because it, it sends, there's a tendency of new technologies to get ado adopted very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it was about seven, eight years ago where I wanted to fight counterfeit goods. And I thought, um, I, I want to create a system. It was called uh, digital asset ID where I can assign a, a hidden ID of say a purse uh, or expensive watch and so I didn't know at the time that I was creating NFTs for physical products. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah. So the misconception most people have of NFTs is that it's a digital art. Mm -hmm. It's not digital art. Everything in the world would be an NFT. And I like to change the word from NFT because it's kind of um, when you try to explain non-fungible, you lose most people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think we should move away from that and just say it's a, it's a digital ID. Mm -hmm. You're signing on the blockchain an ID to a, a physical or digital um, asset. Mm -hmm. So seven years ago, I started that, but I didn't even know much about Bitcoin. And I realized I was creating also a, a hidden key and a public key. And so, so I was by myself, not, I had all these other things going on, so I kind of let it go. So back in 2016, I actually rediscovered Bitcoin and I read the white paper and I said, you know what, this is this time I'm not going to let a new technology go by. Like when the Internet first came out, I remember I got in the mail a floppy disk with a browser. I stuck it in my computer, uh, had a 300 BPS modem, went to a website and I said, oh, that's cool and went about my business, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that, so, that boat sailed. <laughs> so that was like uh, like a total fail um, because yeah. obviously it's changed our lives completely. Yeah. It's yeah. changed our lives to the point where I don't like it. So I'm, I'm of two sides. I'm a proponent of technology and a... Um, I'm reluctant to use it for myself, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it is controlling, um, it's controlling people. 
you know, uh, cell phones control people. So then I, I said to myself, okay, what's Bitcoin? And then I realized it's programmable money. It's okay, so it's money. And then I thought, you know what? I don't know what money means. And I got pissed off because we spend our lives working, doing things and going about our life as a normal person. And do we understand what money is? No. Right. So that's when I wrote this book. It's called The Walking, Walking Working Wallet, The Perpetual Redistribution of Wealth. So what it is, is uh, the government and companies see us as a, uh, healthy enough to have a job. We have a job and they see our wallet. How can mm -hmm. they take that money out first before somebody else does? Mm -hmm. So my discovery of Bitcoin drove me to the discovery of money. So uh, people should understand that if they don't understand what money is and the fact that if you put $10,000 in a bank account today, in five years, it'll be worth 4000 yeah so yeah. there's a there's a depreciation of 10 percent per year and if you just explain that sentence to someone maybe they'll understand wow i should be doing something mm -hmm. so um i remember that christmas i bought some litecoin for my kids you know to get them involved and uh i started accumulating but back then it was the wild west i mean you had to go to exchanges in in Asia and you'd send money and you wouldn't see it for like a week and you'd say, Oh, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then you then you get involved with some shit coins that go to zero. <laughs> 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 so, so then I decided that I'm gonna focus on Bitcoin because it's the only decentralized um, uh, blockchain. Uh -huh. and, and people don't understand that. Everything else is centralized to a certain point. Mm -hmm. okay? So it's the purest form of, say, a digital gold. It's it's a appreciating asset, although sometimes you wonder when it drops 20 or 80%. But I've been there. I remember uh, going to Pacific Beach to walk on the beach, and I looked at my phone, and I saw Bitcoin drop from seven to 3,000. And I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I, I was thinking, you know what? Am I wrong about this? Because, you know, when people say it's going to zero, you start thinking, will it go to zero? Uh, but I kept on purchasing it. And um, I think that nowadays that 2022 has been a dramatic year for all cryptocurrencies. But I think the adoption and the awareness and the fact that CNBC talks about it all the time, the infrastructure has changed. So for me... Uh, Bitcoin is a digital gold. I used to be a gold bug, but, um, you know, if something happens, what do you do? Take a sliver of your one ounce to buy a, a loaf of bread, you no. know, and, and people usually <laughs> want to take it from you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not practical. And like I talk in my book, there was a, a, an island where they used to have these huge, um, like marble, coins so you couldn't lift them you couldn't move them and that was the money system on the island but what they used to do is on consensus everybody would agree that oh my daughter's getting married i'm going to give that stone to the husband okay and everybody in the village would see that i'm giving it to the husband so from then on that stone belonged to the husband mm -hmm. so we've used many forms of uh, money and the U.S. dollar has lost 97% of its value since its inception. Can, can I make a, cl a clear distinction really quick? Because a lot of people say U.S. dollar and they use the market, like the DEX scan to like see how, or the DEX um, index to see how the dollar is doing. But we, it's not a real U.S. dollar. It's a Federal Reserve note. It's the central bank that's decided that this is the currency that the United States is going to be run on. And we've now adopted it as a U.S. dollar. But it's a Federal Reserve note. Yeah, it's actually worthless. It's about uh, worth worth yeah. yeah. Um, because yeah. once we uh, got off the gold standard in 1971, and if you look at the clip of Nixon saying, we're temporary uh, getting off the gold standard. It wasn't temporary at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and what happened is that we'd spent all the gold that all the countries had given us on We're the war. We're still waiting for, for us to go back. No, just kidding. 
<laughs> the temporary period still still in process. Oh yeah, God! Is back then the the twenty dollar note actually said redeemable for gold, so you could take that twenty dollar bill and go to the bank and get gold for it. Mm -hmm. So people got mm -hmm. um, comfortable because it's practical a piece of paper in your pocket, and oh, by right. the way, I can redeem it for gold. Right. So they kind of got used to it, and now there was no gold. There was a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. But we have a trust system amongst each other. So if I give you $20, you know you can go to the store and buy something with it. Mm -hmm. but once that trust is broken, uh, and that can happen. And look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I don't like try and say, oh, this is going to happen for sure. We don't really know. Um, and what's bad now nowadays is there's so many talk, so much talk about a recession. And then people say oh, it's going to be shallow. And uh, why isn't Bitcoin appreciating then when mm -hmm. we have these, um, this high inflation? Mm -hmm. And some people say it's because Bitcoin's not um, mature enough. Um, but I think it's all kind of um, manufactured, you know, like the stock market is, is rigged. Um, I was a day trader for one year, so I, I know the stock market. It, and yeah. It's totally rigged, and I got out of it. And right. so you can say I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, I'm not even sure that I like Ethereum. Um, I know the merge is going to happen uh, because it's controlled by a group of people and Vitalik. And yeah. they, they can decide what to do. And I'm a miner, so I'm mining Ethereum. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens, you know, next month. Yeah. Um, so that was my intro to... Uh, blockchain and uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, it, it's a very interesting story. And ever, like I said, a lot of people take different ways in in coming into this space. They take different doorways that they walk through, or different rabbit holes that they go down to discover what they discover. The fact most people probably that are holding Bitcoin right now may have not even read that white paper. So the fact that you've read the white paper and did some due diligence before even like making that initial investment, even though you heard about it in 2011 and had the opportunity to get two full Bitcoin for signing up for a Coinbase account, that's that's almost insane. That right now at at today's prices, for those of you who may not know, that could just be like a free forty thousand dollars right now, like that he would have got for just signing up to an account. So it's pretty huge, and um. So to talk about, you know, the whole decentralization with block with Bitcoin and you your belief in that Bitcoin is the only decentralized one because there's not a a party involvement or a group of people that are controlling it. How how does your current company fit into what Bitcoin is like? Are you building everything on the Bitcoin blockchain because you are a Bitcoin maximalist? um I, yeah yeah so um and it's funny because i went to a convention a bitcoin convention last december in vegas and i don't mm -hmm. know if you watch uh, uh raul uh, yeah how yeah. yeah it was uh, he invited 400 people and i met um alec oh, alex from uh, celsius and i actually oh, got wow. 15 minutes with him and <laughs> And the reason I'm telling you that, <laughs> and, and it's for funny. those of you who are watching or may not, may be listening and can't see my facial expressions, Celsius has collapsed uh, since the time of this recording. So <laughs> that's why my face is the way it is. Yeah, and it Go was kind on. of sad. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was kind of sad because I met um, an Israeli woman that works for him and. She hooked me up with him and he said, yeah, we're expanding. We're up to 700 employees. And um, at the time, I actually uh, believed I, I had a, block, a BlockFi account, which is similar to Celsius. Mm -hmm. I thought the concept was pretty interesting where you just park your uh, crypto on, on their exchange and you earn 6% interest and then you can borrow off it so you never have to sell your Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was a believer of that, and thank God BlockFi has not gone out of business, but and I, I removed all my money because the old saying, not your keys, not your your coin. Or not your, yeah, not your keys, not your coin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it uh, came back to me, and, uh, and I thought, wow, okay. 
So it doesn't make sense to keep it on a centralized um, platform and there's other companies that have failed. So the that um, so one of the other things I, I gleaned from that uh, convention was like four days is the, there was a congressman from Minnesota, I've forgotten his name, and um, he's a pro crypto. Oh, by the way, the word crypto in Greek means I hide, okay? Wow, but, I love yeah. that. But it's not what we think, because some people think we are hiding a crypto, but it's a cryptography. It's a system right. to, to secure mm -hmm. and hide, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a misconception sometimes with the word uh, cryptocurrency uh, where you, you think you're hiding. So this this um, senator said, uh, no, congressman said um, two words. Oh, he said one word that really impacted me. He said, well, I'm promoting Web3. And, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Uh, how do you know what Web3 is? I thought to myself, <laughs> because <laughs> you're going to tell other congressmen and senators about Web3. So then I realized that this was going to be a candy wrap, okay? So mm -hmm. government doesn't want to talk about crypto, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, Bitcoin, okay? Mm -hmm. But hey, Web3, that comes after one and two, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's cover everything and we'll call it Web3, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I'll ask you a question. What is your uh, short interpretation of Web3? Uh, my short interpretation of Web3 is ownership of our personal data that we utilize. Like, so Web1 would be the internet in its early days where it was read only. Like you could go to a website and read data. Web2 then became where we could interact. I could share with you what I had for lunch that day, or I can show you the beautiful sunset that I saw on my, my, on my walk that evening. That's Web2 where there's interaction. You like, you comment. You talk to your friends on there via, via social media, all the social media platforms. Well, those social media platforms have made billions of dollars on the data that they collect from you by you setting up those accounts, by you sharing what you share, by the algorithms. Web3 to me is ownership of that data and deciding what is going to happen with that data and who is going to to make out financially from it, whether it be me or if I choose to to say, no, you can have it, you know, you do what you want with it. But that to me, that's my definition of Web3 is ownership. Okay. So for me, it's simple. It's decentralization. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> Very short. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's, let's define decentralization for a moment then, because some people who might be listening could be brand new to this space. Um, and not understand what centralization or decentralization is versus centralization. Okay, so uh, owning your own money, like Bitcoin, mm -hmm. it's not in a bank. Uh, most people don't realize that when you put money in a bank, uh, they give you an IOU. It's not your money. Mm -hmm. And in Greece, for four years, they stopped people taking money out of the bank. You allowed, I think, uh, 200 euro a week. So it's yeah. not your not your money. So uh, decentralization means that you, like you mentioned, is you own everything, your, your personal information, the revenue generated by your actions, um, your, your medical records, you're the owner. And other companies don't monetize it. So for me, uh, one of the important things is owning your own money because obviously governments control people via money. Mm -hmm. uh, taxation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a really interesting book called um, uh, God. I started reading it. It's uh, about taxation, and um, it's uh, oh, it's called Daylight Robbery. Okay, so oh, do you know beautiful it, title. Love that. But do you know uh, where that phrase came from and what it means? I, I mean, daylight robbery to me. I I don't know, but my hearing it right off as you said it was like the idea that they are just kind of putting these taxations in place and essentially stealing from us every single day, every single moment via taxation in broad daylight. They don't even have to do it behind hidden doors. It's like, hey, here we are. Give us our money. Yeah, and the origin of it came from the 1500s where <clears throat> to tax you, they would come into your house and see how many fireplaces you had. So in England, if you had three fireplaces, they would say tax you $75. If you had one, they'd tax you 25 
So people said, I don't want this guy coming into my house all the time, okay? Yeah. It's an intrusion. So they changed it to counting windows of the house, okay? <laughs> oh, my God. So uh, there was a trend for 70 years where people boarded up their windows and new buildings had less windows. Yeah. So the term came from uh, daylight robbery that the government uh, robbed daylight from inside their house. That is crazy. I got to get that book, Daylight Robbery. Wow. Yeah, and it goes back to Babylonian times and, you know, taxation. Actually, the Greeks were the first to tax people in a democratic way. Um, and so coming back to decentralization. So one of my products is Citadel Data, and I came up with the idea three, four years ago um, where I found out that I don't own my medical records. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So if, if a doctor uh, prescribes a, a blood test, mm -hmm. uh, you want to show another doctor, you have to get permission from Dr. A. Mm -hmm. So I thought, that's crazy. It's my medical records. Why can't I have ownership of it? Mm -hmm. So I created um, still all data, but it morphed into something else where basically it's a secure way to keep your information, because uh, what it does is it not only encrypts the files, but it, it fragments them and puts little pieces on multiple servers. And also it can never be tampered with because the, um, the point of the file is the contents of the file. So nobody can ever modify the file. Mm -hmm. And so um, the last four and a half years, I've been writing an EMR uh, system for a medical startup and I realized that HIPAA compliance is unattainable. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, data is going to get hacked all the time. And it has. Yeah, yeah. every day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. So, I mean, just here in San Diego, some of the big medical hospitals, you know, just even within the last six months have been hacked, you know, and, and patient records are out there, you know. And you had shared even at the, the meeting uh, last week about, them having to pay ransom to the hackers to get you know the information back to or however that went down but it, but it, it happens quite frequently like you said yeah so if you think of um web 3 and also you've got to remember there's also web 5 i don't know if you know web 5. i've heard the term thrown around so much and i still don't know the definition of web 5. can you break it down yeah, I'll, I'll tell you after we go okay. back. Okay, okay. Um, so, so for me, decentralization also includes using IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system for um, decentralized storage. So, and that mm -hmm. doesn't use blockchain. So it's a little beyond just blockchain when you talk about Web3. And something we've got to be careful about Web3, there's a lot of bigger companies that want to monetize and control it because Web 2 is controlled by five or six companies, okay? Yes. It's a walled gardens. And um, there's some companies now that want to take Web 3 and kind of make it another three, uh, five companies, not the same, but another five. So we've got to be careful as individuals that we don't let that happen. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to happen. <clears throat> so decentralization is a key word I use because think of it as you, like you said, owning your stuff, okay? I don't care what it is, your identity. Um, and I don't know if you use the uh, Brave browser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> the concept yep. of that is that you, um, if you go and view somebody's site, um, you get the money and the person's site gets, gets the money, not Google. Right. Right. But, you know, it's, it's very difficult to change um, people's habits and educate them enough to say, here's the impact. You know, yeah. why aren't more people doing this? Right. So it's easy to say decentralize everything. But when most of the people are <clears throat> centralized in the sense of their thinking, because if you think about it, when 60% of Americans or more live paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. okay, and you shut down the businesses, you have to give them money. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that's by design. We've created a system of debt. Mm -hmm. And that's why Bitcoin is actually the only solution because um, the M2 money supply and the money created is created by debt. 
So when people yeah. say we got to yeah. cut the deficit, that's uh, rubbish. I mean, you can't cut the deficit. You you'll cease um, you'll seize up the economy. Right. Well, n n like when new debt is generated, that's like new money being minted into mm -hmm. the economy. So debt has to exist to some level. But what you're saying with the, the people living paycheck to paycheck, they don't know how to use debt to their advantage. Like a lot of the Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, you know, p big, huge people doing big things are using debt to their advantage. Yeah. And that's why I wrote this book, um, because you know, the subtitle is the perpetual uh, redistribution of wealth, because that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, most people never get ahead. Right. You know, they, they We are taxed in so many different ways. The system is actually very uh, sophisticated in extracting every penny out of your pocket. Because I found out some things, like, for example, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when you turn 65, you have to enroll in Medicare. Yes. And yes. Yeah, you're not allowed to have uh, stay with the old policy unless you're working in a company that has more than 20 employees. Right. So, so I thought, okay, well, that's free, okay? But it's yeah, not no, free. It's, it's not. Yeah. No, Basically, not. the government steals uh, patients from Anthem Blue Cross, say. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's a good way of putting it. I haven't heard it like that. But, yes, they are st stealing patients. And then if you don't enroll into their program – you get fined like hundreds of dollars every single month if you don't get into their program. It's ridiculous. Yeah, so because crazy. it's a source of revenue for them. Yeah. And, and the problem is that um, the system is so sophisticated in extracting money. If you look at your bills, so in my book, I write some examples where you, um, you look at any bill and you'll see like your telephone bill for T-Mobile, say something about a nuclear maintenance of a nuclear plant or something, you know, 50 yeah. cents. I think, where does that come from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what nuclear plant? <laughs> yeah, right. And why am I paying maintenance on that? You guys need to be. <laughs> yeah, and some other reason to say, um, so your assets. So if you could teach people that you have to invest in the appreciating assets, um, and not make, hold on to fiat currencies. That's the key right there. Mm -hmm. um, but most people don't know what to invest in. I mean, uh, majority of people are not invest in the stock market. You know? Right. Right. And can they put aside twenty dollars a, a month into Bitcoin? Yeah, they could. Right. Um, again, it's not financial advice. Um, uh, Bitcoin, you know, is something that's very volatile and scares people a lot. But eventually it's got to go up because of all this printing of money and depreciating assets. So people, I, I sent you an email with a uh, thought I had the other day because um, I was also a real estate broker for uh, like six years. Um, I got into the market in 2008 just before the, before the crash. Right. Wow. And, and um, it was really interesting because uh, a broker is someone that can hang a license and have agents work for them. Mm -hmm. But what I did is I scraped all the MLSs and created my own websites and promoted them. And then I had 15 agents working for me, giving them the leads. Right. Um, it got to the point where the market was so bad because houses uh, dropped so much. So people say, look, houses are too expensive. They've risen 30% in one year. Mm -hmm. well, Hang on a second. Is the housing gone up or is it because your dollar is buying less? The dollar is buying less, for yeah. sure. Groceries. My wife says, look, everything's going up. And yes, you've got certain instances like, you know, crude from uh, the war in uh, Ukraine that impact mm -hmm. prices. But mm -hmm. it's buying power of the money that we work for. And we are exchanging um, our time and freedom for depreciating asset, the dollar. Mm -hmm. So for me, the freedom and the time is very important. And unfortunately, most people are so in depth in the system where they, they have a, an apartment, they had a child now, they have to pay car insurance. There's just no way out for them mm -hmm. that they can see. So they just continue on this little hamster, what do you call those little wheels? Little hamster wheels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Running, 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 running. Looking out, wait, do I get anywhere? No, you didn't get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> As 
like different day, same, same routines, you know, it's over and over and over. It is, it's, it's a very sad reality of, of what it has been. Um, but I do, I do believe that this technology and, and the cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin have the potential to really shift and change things around massively. But there's also aspects where we have to hang on to that as as a community or a group of people versus just allowing. And, and I don't know, I didn't even have this question prepared or even thought of until now, but I don't know what your thoughts are on the whole um, central bank digital currency and what they're trying to do with the CBDC. Um, and I, I, my personal feeling, and I'm not a cons like trying to get into conspiracy at all, but it, it's almost like they allow, or they're just kind of just watching the, the crazy wild West stuff collapse and fall apart to almost use that as a way to usher in or, or get a lot of propaganda around their digital coin. That is essentially no different than utilizing fiat currency and it doesn't take you you're still on the hamster wheel and you're still running and you're still doing all that stuff like different thing same outcome well the dollar is a digital uh currency this only three percent of um, money in the world is used uh physically paper yeah or yeah coin. that's three percent right. i was in sweden about I think 15 years ago, and I was surprised because nobody accepted checks. Um, you had to use a, a debit card for everything. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. was 15 years ago. And so, you know, the government uh, likes to say that money is dirty, you know, it's um, used for um, money laundering, pornography, you know, the same story about the internet, when the internet yeah. first came out. And, and so, uh, so another controversy that's happened now is, is a software, um, I forgot what it's called. That's a mixer that's been banned by the SEC. Okay. Uh-uh. Uh, I think it's called Volcano or something. So you know what a mixer is? No. Uh-uh. Okay. So to hide, because um, Bitcoin is transparent, you can go to a website and see all the transactions. Right. It takes some work to find out the owner of the address, but it's the FBI prefers that you use uh, cryptocurrency for illicit activities because they can find you. Sure. Yeah. So a mixer is similar to Monero, but it's basically it takes a, whole, a lot of transactions and it mixes them together. So nobody can see oh. who the transaction went where. And uh, the developer in, in Holland was arrested uh, last week. Was that the, tor the tornado crash? Yeah, yeah, tornado. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now there's a big debate because, hang on a second. So the SEC is saying we're banning this. American right. citizens cannot use it. Right. But but have they got the right to ban it? It's software. It's it's a open source software. Okay. Yeah. So now we get into this weird place where the SEC is trying to control everything, and so for our protection, because all all is that story. You know that it's for your protection. Always. Uh, Always. <laughs> I'm so, like, I don't need you to protect me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're, too stupid. you're too stupid to make a decision on your own. So we have yeah. to protect you. Right. Uh, the same with investing. You know, we have to protect you. Um, and, you know, this is funny because it goes back to our forefathers. Like, I never understood, understood the electoral vote. Okay. Yeah. And that right. was created. It should be a vote. Everybody votes. And what are the votes? Count them. Uh, the Victoria yeah, if it was 50 votes for Nico and 60 for Dr. Brooke, then Dr. Brooke won. Instead of yeah. having the electoral college decide, like, hmm, who do I pick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that goes back to when there were farmers and people spread out, so they elect somebody to represent them, okay? Right. But right. that's back then. You know, there was no Wi-Fi. and. <laughs> 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 yeah. So we're still deemed as dumb, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, the system has created us to be dumb. And I'll give you an example: in 36 years of being involved with technology and witnessing, and actually, I started programming in '75, but witnessing people's understanding of technology, I've realized it's it's gone backwards. And the reason is because we're creating systems like the iPhone that is making us dumber. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, like I turn off notification, I turn off the auto spell. Like yeah. I'd send a text and it said instead of um 
uh, loading, I put, it says laughing and I had to type again. No, I didn't say laughing, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that was my stupid cell phone <laughs> correcting me. Yeah. yeah. My smart, but stupid cell phone. It's supposed to be smart, but it's not. <laughs> and it's funny because I remember in the, in the beginning days, there was a PDA, PDA called handspring. And, um, I thought, wow. Uh, this is going to be, become a smartphone. You know, you just have to add the capabilities of a phone. And then they had a slot on the top where they made it a phone. Mm. So, and I thought it would take too long for technology to evolve because back then I made a real estate sign that had a text message, okay? You could mm -hmm. text a, a, a number and you get a, a pictures and text back about the property. Yeah. So I was in LA in front of 400 people, uh, realtors, and I started explaining this technology I developed and I looked around the room and nobody understood what I was saying because they didn't have smartphones, they had flip phones. <laughs> <laughs> so back then I looked at the curve of the uh, usage of texting and I knew it was going to explode, but yeah. it hadn't yet. Yeah. So, so you were um, early, you were very early into that. Yeah. Um, I was early yeah. into everything, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. Uh, what were we talking about? Uh, it was um... well, decentralization versus centralization, and what um, cit citadel? Did I say that right? Citadel. Citadel. Yes. Yeah. Like what? How you're utilizing that in a decentralized world? Uh, well, you said it's not because you're using IPFS. It's not like 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 on an actual blockchain but the company is acting as the like a decentralized company for the health records and piecing it all together or having the fragments on the different file systems, but being able to bring it all back together. Yeah, but we don't control it. It is an open source project. So okay. we're, not, we're not, so a lot of people think, well, we have control of the, the, the documents. No, you download the app and it creates an ecosystem where you can uh, save your uh, documents, take pictures, and then, and then you can share it with people. So if you want mm -hmm. to share it with an attorney, mm -hmm. they have this app and they can only see it in that ecosystem. But mm -hmm. we don't control the data. It's part of this open source technology called IPFS. And let me explain another component of decentralization. Uh, and I think we talked about it at the meeting last, it was uh, unstoppable domains, but yeah. the backbone to unstoppable domains is IPFS. Mm -hmm. I'll explain mm -hmm. why. I think it was three years ago where the Turkish government decided that they don't want, didn't want the citizens of Turkey to um, look at Wikipedia. Okay. Oh. So they, they turned it off and banned it. Okay. Yeah. So Wikipedia then published the, the website on IPFS. Hmm. And you cannot stop someone's website on IPFS. Yeah. It's decentralized. Unstoppable right. Domains is a domain naming system that is also decentralized mm -hmm. and it cannot be stopped. Uh, unstoppable. They, there it is. Unstoppable. <laughs> yeah. So I have my website on IPFS as well. So yeah. the way to, um, so I'll give you another example. What is the average lifespan of a web page? Ooh, months, years? 100 days. I don't know. How many? 100 days. Wow. Wow. So in essence, we're losing our history. Mm -hmm. Because all these uh, companies and websites that were created 10, 15, 20 years ago are gone. Yes. The servers are shut down, the files are gone. Yeah. So in essence, we are destroying and losing our future. Right. So if you put it on unstoppable uh, on IPFS, it's called the permanent web, because it never goes away. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is some moral implications of, of that in the sense that what if there's information on there? So we're talking about censorship. Like, mm -hmm. uh, do we need the government to censor us? No. Um, what if there's child pornography on, on an IPFS website? Well, that, yeah, that, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, that is a tough one. Because I yeah. would say, obviously, you want to take that, get that off. But if that's on permanent web through IPFS, yeah. Ooh, I do see the moral dilemma there. Yeah. So 
do we need babysitting to a certain point? I mean, I guess that's why we have jails, but you know, it's ironic where so many people are jailed for uh, possessing drugs and then the government says, oh, we can make money. It's legal now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but hey, you're gonna still stay in there because uh, we need you there. <laughs> So there's some yeah, moral, right. uh, moral questions to answer. And yeah. I think I still believe in decentralization, obviously, and there's so many ways that it can happen. And mm-hmm. the fact that we have to be careful as individuals that we actually enforce this and we don't let another set of companies or government. Uh, and I'm not an anarchist, you know, uh, I pay taxes. I understand mm-hmm. that you have to pay to get roads fixed. You need firefighters. Um, but will we come to a point where we decide how government spends money? Yes, I think that's a that's a fair statement. I think that's absolutely a fair statement. Yeah. So do we want the government to build a new aircraft carrier for $10 billion? Or do we want to feed starving children in the South? Mm-hmm. You know? Right. Right. And that's something else I think government's not very good at doing. They're not good at spending money. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh because I'm like, yes, right, exactly. They're not good at spending money, you know, but they'll they'll turn around and, and give money. You know, they, they, they printed tons of money over the course of COVID to try to keep businesses or people happy and, you know, and like moving through this whole thing. But then look at what it created on the back end. Like here we're at, sitting in 2022, two years after that, you know, like, and people are like, oh, it's not a recession. It is a recession. Not to go back to the whole rece- recession standpoint, but if you look at the definition of a recession being two negative quarters of GDP, then we truly are, in fact, in a recession. And I feel like there's sometimes when the government tries to like be like create this soft landing or like, you know, we're just going to have you like fall into you know, a pile of feathers and everything's going to be okay versus being real and honest with what's happening and learning to actually take responsibility for what they're doing and coming, you know, because the government wasn't created as, as a, as a forceful player and trying to like control all these people, at least in my personal beliefs way back when, you know, that the U S constitution was written, but it's become such a massive dictatorship that we literally, like you said, they make decisions on what they're doing in all in the name of protection. We're going to protect you. So therefore we have to have all this red tape or you can't do this or, Hey, you can't invest into this property or into this, this fund because you're not accredited, accredited, you know, for the sec under their guidelines. So I, there's, there's definitely a lot to unpack here, Nico. And I think we've gotten like, through a lot of good thought process in terms of, you know, decentralization and the benefits of it, but then also the moral dilemma with IPFS, because I think there's there's going to be incredible websites built on IPFS, yours included. But yeah, you're right. Like there, there's a lot to, a lot to think about. Yeah. (laughs) And it's funny about the so my I've been telling people that we're not in a recession. We're not going to go into a recession. I've I've said that for the last six months. Okay. Um, because I think we've we've fabricated. So it's a bunch of guys with switches and knobs. Okay. Yes. And yes. <laughs> we we are controlling the economy. First of all, there shouldn't be a Federal Reserve. No. Uh, yeah. Uh-uh. I'm always shocked uh, that uh, a lot of people think that the Federal Reserve is a government entity. It's not, it's not, (laughs) it's not. And I like, I, this is one little aspect I will go down a little conspiracy train on and like, but but I want you to like, I, I want the listeners to hear this for a second. John F. Kennedy, when he was president of the United States, he was about to sign an executive order to take the U.S. dollar back. To basically say Federal Reserve, we're not going to work with you anymore. We're going to become the U.S. You can look at the, you can look up this executive order. Well, if it's still up there, but now what happens, JFK? Like he's no longer alive. Like I, I truly believe that there were some powers to at, at play there that that did not want that to happen because the Federal Reserve is such a a, a powerful force, and they don't just control the United States. Like there's a lot of other 
countries that they they have their hands involved in. Well, anyway, there's, I digress. There's <laughs> saying that anybody that wanted to get rid of the Federal Reserve is dead. <laughs> Basically, that that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, there's an interesting book I, I'm reading, the Jekyll Island, where the um, actually the Federal Reserve was created, and um, it's a it's a private company owned by banks. Yeah. They decide the monetary um, system in the state. So interest rates should be uh, left to just, it should be a market force that changes interest rates. We shouldn't try and uh, raise interest rates, lower interest rates, create all this havoc. So what I think is because everything's so manufactured and manipulated that a depression is something that they can turn off in a second, okay? Mm -hmm. They can yeah. just go start dropping interest rates, they can print more money. So that's why I think it's not in their best interest to, in an election year two, to say, oh, uh, there's a recession, you guys are gonna be um, suffering. So that's, that's true. Reason, yeah. That's true. That's why Especially I think- Especially in an election market, year. Yeah, and that's why the stock market's gonna go back up um, because yeah. it has to go up, keep all the fat cats, you know, uh, happy, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. I'm not, yeah, I, I don't look, it's funny because as an immigrant, I see things a little different, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'm a US citizen, um, I hope I've contributed to, to this country to make it a better country, um, mm -hmm. I feel that I was disillusioned because I thought countries like Greece or Romania, there's a lot of corruption, but I think there's a lot of corruption in this country too, it just yeah. um, works differently. Yep. So, I, I agree. So, so with all that said, like in what we just talked there, you know, within the last like 10 to 15 minutes, that, that whole, you know, just where everything is at, how can we start to see a brighter future? Like, what do you see? Where do you see the, the rays of sunshine coming out um, in terms of this whole aspect of web three and we didn't actually define web five so i want to definitely go back to that but like what does the future look like for you well for me it's always education okay mm -hmm. so i know i'm i'm different because i went to, to private schools all my life and i had a good education i like to read mm -hmm. um, and i think that's critical and i'll give you an example and, and the, the answer to your question is it's quite simple it's education, but starting with the young people. Like, for example, um, my 10 year old son um, plays chess all the time. He reads nearly one book a day. Um, yeah, he's uh, learned Chinese. Okay. Wow. He, he's got his own YouTube channel where he's teaching kids how to play Minecraft. And obviously, you know, children listen and watch you. So it's not if you're bad with, with, with your money, your kids yeah. will be bad. Yeah. It's not what you tell them, it's what you do. Yes. Okay? Yeah. And so, first of all, is it really strange how there's no um, education for kids about economics? Right. And right. The, the Greek word, and I'll, I'll throw this up because 28% of the dictionary is Greek. You know that? I, yeah, I have heard that. Yes. Okay. So, economia comes from the word uh, house, basically. Uh, it's your house, so it's taking care of your house. Mm -hmm. So we we don't teach kids at a young age about economics. Uh, people don't know how to reconcile their checkbook, or they don't have a checkbook. They just put the debit card to see how much money they got left. Okay. Right. <laughs> and then right. this this new theme. When did I see it? Somewhere where, oh, buy today, pay later. Yes. What the yes. hell's that? My that God. that that is really rampant right now. Very very rampant with PayPal, like paying for a, companies like Affirm, where you can literally do retail shopping at the mall and utilize a pay in for, and so you're not even like really thinking about what kind of money is going out, like what is being expended. So educating kids. Um, uh, my son obviously knows a lot about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. uh, and he. He actually gets into conversations with a teacher at school about it. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to, to tell, uh, say, hey, our kids need an education in economics. Yeah. In elementary school, in right. high school, and in college. 
but it's not to the best interest of the government or the companies to teach us. They're breeding consumers, okay? Exactly. That's all mm -hmm. their goal is to breed a consumer to consume products. 70% mm -hmm. of the economy is based on consumer uh, buying. So it, it's, it's unfortunately that the whole system is built like that and it takes a, a lot of energy and effort. And uh, But I think if we educate people, like we're educating people at the meetup, I've been talking about IPFS for seven years. I just keep mm -hmm. at it. I'm very persistent. Um, <laughs> and, it's a good know, quality. It's a good quality. Yeah, I'm, I'm real like a bulldog. I just don't give up. I um, yeah. don't stop. But the reason I do the meetups is to educate people. And uh, most of the time there's newbies that come and they don't know much. They're interested. And I don't know where it goes from there. Um, but then you have to educate kids. Mm -hmm. And why do we not educate our children in this country? Yeah. And that's a whole farce in itself, isn't it? Like my son today is taking some national tests or something. Yeah. Who cares? That's just their way of controlling things. Oh, by the way, everybody scored much less um, than basically, oh, let's lower the score. Yeah, yeah right. But, it, but it's also just for the school to turn around and say like, oh, we're ranked the highest school in the district or for all of California or for all of whatever state. And it's just for them to, you know, try to get more people to kind of want to, I'm going to go to that school because that's the highest ranked. And then they just get more funding. It's not for the benefit of the child at all. Yeah, and, and the whole system of the educational system is based on farming, you know, back in the day with mm -hmm. summer vacation because they had to harvest crops and when it starts. And why do kids have to go to school from the ages of 5 to 18? What are they yeah. doing? Right. No. I know that, uh, look, as an engineer, for me, math is a, a really important uh, skill. And most uh, kids say, uh, I'm not good at math. And I say, no, you're lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing, nothing to do with not being good at something it's just uh, repetition you know you, you yeah. start doing yeah, problems yeah. you learn by repeating yeah. it yeah and, and so the problem we have is that um you know I, I went to my other son's high school and they started like fractions in ninth grade and i said fractions my god here, I'll spend five minutes to teach you about fractions. You take an apple, cut it in half, here's two halves. We're done. Teaching fractions in high school, ninth grade, my God. That is, that is pretty late, for sure, for sure. Because no, there's no retention. No, no. So what's no. the point? Right, absolutely. And I and I agree with you. I think education is a big thing. And that's what I'm, you know, doing and my desire and my hope, um, you know, and what inspires me to keep going with the podcast is not only to connect with awesome, incredible human beings like yourself, but also to provide a platform that somebody can go to for free, you know, and listen at, in their own leisure while they're getting ready for work in the morning or something just to kind of get their mind going about like like this was awesome because we got to talk about like the money system in general and not just blockchain, but how blockchain and web three is going to kind of really shift that around. But, it, you know, just really, like you said, educating people and getting them, getting them the repetition that they need to like hear these things. So. I okay. Think web, web, web five. Okay. So yeah, it's, tell me web five. So it's a, it's a Jack Dorsey thing. Okay. Okay. So block guy. He's a he's a Bitcoin maximist. Okay, so for those who don't know Jack Dorsey, he's the or was the old CEO of Twitter, founder of Twitter, um, and now has BlockFi and Bitcoin maximalist. Yeah, he actually um, is a co-founder of uh, used to be Square, and it's called Block now. Yes. So okay. Square is the thing you used to put in your phone. You put in your phone mm -hmm. to credit cards. So he's left uh, Twitter to focus on uh, Bitcoin, and um, he he doesn't he thinks Web three is a farce. Is a what? A farce. Okay. Okay. Is BS? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I know. So where did Web? Well, tell me what Web five is, and then we'll try to determine where Web four went. <laughs> Well, I think he's giving some distance between three and five. Oh, we need some social distancing. 
<laughs> well, well, yeah. Yeah. Forward, forward validate fire three, though, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what he thinks is that um, I don't know if you've used any wallets that use um, Lightning. I've not used Lightning, but I've used other wallets. I have other wallets. Yeah, but there's Lightning is really fast and cheap. Okay. I'll do a demo next time at the meetup because yeah. he, he's uh, incorporating uh, light, uh, Lightning into his solutions at uh, Block. Okay. And, and he, he wants to base everything on uh, Bitcoin, not Ethereum. So okay. Ethereum yeah. is Web3, mm -hmm. Web5 is uh, Bitcoin. Got it. So that's that's a simple that's answer. Okay, so the so then the so he's running everything on Lightning Network on top of the Bitcoin chain blockchain, mm -hmm. and that's Web Five. Got it. Got it. Okay, that's a that's a good definition. Now I know because I I have heard a lot of terminology or, or I've heard that term quite a lot. And it's interesting because the same time I've heard about that was all about Lightning Network and Bitcoin. So great definition. Thank you for that, Nico. Well, uh, just as a disclosure that sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> check back. <me. laughs> no, and here we are. No, just kidding. No, you know what? The, the, what's incredible and what I absolutely admire the most about this space is we are all learning together as well. Um, nobody is like the utmost expert in anything and i think that even the experts in like will tell you most of them um if their egos are taken out of the equation that they're also learning and they're learning you know as they go because there's still a lot to be uncovered and discovered through this whole process of you know this new new decentralized world that we're we're moving into so um is there any closing thoughts before we um, bring the ride into the station, bring the train into the station. <laughs> no, I, I think what people should do is educate themselves, but also take the plunge. I think at some point yeah. I have so many friends that for five years, seven years, I've been saying, just buy a little bit of Bitcoin, man, put two hundred dollars away. And yeah. to this date, they haven't done it. Oh, well, I've got to study it. You know, I've got to find out what it means. So yeah. if you're not going to go to that, um, go down the rabbit hole, as you say, um, just buy some, a small portion. And like you said, you bought just a little, and you didn't care if it went to zero. Right. Then right. you start saying, oh, wow, this may go much higher than zero. <laughs> so, I, I, I got to understand this. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So my advice is study it, but also just take the plunge maybe because um, put a bit aside like you with any portfolio if you have a small diversity like say 2.5 percent in gold that makes mm -hmm. sense nobody's going to think you're crazy mm -hmm. the same thing with bitcoin um mm -hmm. put two percent or one percent right. in bitcoin and if it goes to zero it goes to zero you're not impacted because right. i really think that it is the going to be the transformation of wealth from one group of people to another uh, that's definite in my opinion and some people are just lucky yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I'm glad it's being said from a different mouth than just my mouth every single <laughs> episode. I, I know my my co-pilots and my guests, let, you know, definitely confirm what I'm saying, but I want other people to hear it from other sources and not just myself, because it's not my thought process. It's collectively as a group, the those of us who truly understand what this space is capable of and where we're heading. Like we understand that there is a, is a lot of generational wealth um, that can be capitalized on when you do the proper research, when you get involved in, you know, like you said, just setting aside some money in Bitcoin. If you don't do anything else, just put it there um, because the hedge against or the risk against what could happen is very low to the upside potentials that can be gained as a result of taking that chance on yourself and taking a chance on um, a new brand new technology. So. Awesome. And then I spend at least two hours a day studying um, these technologies, and um, it's a, a learning process. It's yep. evolving constantly. There's always so many new things coming along, and and don't get persuaded by like a lot of hype. Um, I, yeah. I noticed on YouTube now there's a lot of 
images of people with their eyes wide open and red and arrows and I saw these people by stopped. I said, if you put a thumbnail on there that's got your big eyes open and your mouth open, I'm not watching you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love it. I love it. Well, Nico, where can people find you in the interwebs? How can they connect with you further? Um, my company name is NTI Blockchain. So it's ntiblockchain.com. My mm -hmm. bank actually calls me occasionally and says to me, hey, are you buying Bitcoin? And I said, what <laughs> business is it of yours? <laughs> yeah. Don't ask me what I'm doing. This is my company. But yeah, because you have the word blockchain in there, it gives them a little like, ooh, scared by <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said to me it's a very high risk asset. Okay, thank you. So it went like this, and it's really high risk. Yeah, um, exactly. It's too high, too high. I'm gonna, oh. I'm gonna meet up, um, and it's kind of a long name. I don't even know what it is. I think it's uh, Bitcoin Blockchain IPFS Web Three, uh, and it's based here in San Diego. I'll I'll put the link for the meetup as well as your. Um, company links in the show notes so people can easily find it and click on it and, and join. So definitely um, we'll have access to you that way for sure too. Okay. We meet once a month and we, I've been doing it for seven years and we now have a, a hybrid of a, a virtual and physical. Uh, the mm -hmm. last one was a bit of a, a mess. But <laughs> hey, we'll work out all those pieces as we go, right? Yep. <laughs> So. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, interviewing me. It was a pleasure, and I uh, hope that there's a little, one little piece of information that may help someone move down uh, further down this rabbit hole. There was definitely a lot of pieces uh, here, so not even just one. There's a ton of takeaways. Uh, thank you all for being here as we pull this train into the station. I hope you all don't have whiplash. Um, I know it was a little wild one. But we had a lot of fun. And Nico, thank you so much for being here. I will uh, get to see you guys all on the next ride. And for now, we will see you later. Bye. <laughs> Bye. You made it. Congratulations. You made it. Congratulations. That wasn't so bad, was it? I hope you laughed and learned a little bit more about this Web3 universe and how simple and fun it can really be. Would you be so kind as to leave us a review and share it with your friends and family? It would mean so much to get this out to more people as we embark on the greatest transfer of wealth that has ever happened in human history. Can't wait to see you on the next one.